Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to wait a couple of minutes as our uh, public um, Zoom room populates. It takes a couple of seconds for everybody to, to log in, and then we'll get started. Um, so good morning, and thanks for joining us. And Mike, it looks like uh, Senator Skinner and Professor Ochin are both part of the crew now. Terrific. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, and welcome to this meeting on the Committee on the Revision of the Penal Code, which is now in session. I'm Mike Romano, committee chair. Uh, thank you all for joining us today uh, virtually. This is our seventh committee meeting of uh, 2021. Uh, I'd like to begin with a roll call and I'll go in alphabetical order. Uh, Judge Espinoza? Present. Uh, Assemblymember Lee? Present. Uh, Justice Moreno? Uh, present. Professor Ochin? Present. And Senator Skinner? Present. Good to see you all today. Um, thanks for joining us. We have a really important agenda and uh, I look forward to making progress today. I think it'll be a, a productive meeting. Um, so here's the, here's the agenda. Today's meeting, we will not hear from panelists or discuss new substantive topics, which is our usual course of business. Instead, we'll follow up on topics and ideas identified at prior meetings and then vote on recommendations we, uh, that we want to continue for development into our annual report, which we hope to publish uh, around Thanksgiving or December. Um, we will begin the meeting with a brief update on some important administrative matters. Uh, then we'll have a presentation from our data research partners at the California Policy Lab, followed by a staff presentation on the eight potential uh, recommendations. We'll then have a period of public comment, followed by further discussion of the recommendations before voting. We have to have the public comment before we vote on the recommendations. Um, this meeting, unlike many of our others, will be a one-day affair. It will be a full day, I suspect but I promise we'll take uh, breaks uh, along the way. Uh, any questions about the agenda? All right, uh, some of the administrative matters. Um, before getting started with the substance of this meeting, I just wanna give a few important updates. First, um, this is something that I think we should all be very proud of. Um, six of our recommendations from last year, um, including those on gangs, dismissal on enhancements and ending mandatory minimums for drug crimes passed the legislature uh, as its session closed last week and are now awaiting the governor's signature. A seventh reform regarding prison credits was adopted by regulation. I, this is, a, this is a, a, a huge accomplishment, I think, testament. Um, it's it's a, a ton of work, obviously, by our um, lawmaker partners on this panel, other senators and assembly uh, members who picked up our recommendations, staff consultants, a lot of work went into this. Um, I'm especially grateful to Senator Skinner um, and others, but I, I'm really proud. And, I, and, and just, just for um, some context, uh, behind me, I think I've mentioned before that there, there was a, uh, in 1969, um, there was a joint committee on the revision of the penal code. And this is their uh, recommendations from the Stanford uh, library. I don't even have all the volumes here. Um, and actually none of them got passed. And so that we were able to, um, in our first year, of course, you know, I don't wanna count chickens because uh, we need to wait for the governor's signature, but that, that they made them through almost all of the recommendations that got picked up as bills uh, passed, and, and I think that we should be uh, very proud. Of course, they're based on months of study, exhaustive research by staff, including interviews by experts who did not appear before the committee, and of course, the testimony of those who prevent, pre presented to the committee, who, as you know, represented a broad cross-section of law enforcement, crime victims, scholars, elected and appointed officials, including Governors Newsom and Brown, and then Attorney General Becerra, uh, plus some formerly incarcerated folks, a person who was actually currently incarcerated and advocates and experts on as many sides as we could, we could cram, uh, cram in. Uh, Tom, can you just share a slide with the short summaries of the bills just so we have a sense of where they all stand? All right, 
So these, so these are the bills um, that were uh, adopted. Um, again, they should sort of be familiar. I don't know if anybody has any questions or Senator Skinner, if there's any, or, or Assembly Member Lee, if you guys have any special comments about these bills or the process. This is Judge Espinosa. I have a question whether the Judicial Council weighed in on SB 81 at any point. Yeah, that's that's a good question. We worked with um, them extensively. Tom, remember, yeah. how did they eventually come out? We, we worked with Judicial Council extensively and exhaustively. Right. And uh, there were, it worked out and we made some adjustments for them. There were some aspects of it I felt that they didn't, um, I won't, it's not appropriate for me to say that they didn't fully understand given that I am not a lawyer and uh, they were judges or lawyers, but I would say that they, um, uh, it was sometimes a difficult conversation, but uh, Tom and Natasha Minsker, who is, uh, has been um, on contract with the committee, as well as um, Stella Choi, Choi, who is the staff to the Senate Public Safety Committee, and who did the analysis of the bill for Senate Public Safety, and was really, you know, very good uh, interacting with them, helped the process a great deal. But Tom, if you want to comment on any of this, their specific concerns and how we adjusted those, that would be great. But yes, we spent hours with them. That, you know, I think the main concern, and it makes a lot of sense, was they just anything that touches on judicial discretion, they um, want to be very careful about. And uh, their feedback was, you know, I think instrumental in, in some of the, the changes that were made. And um, I think as we talk about some of the recommendations today, uh, it's a helpful lessons learned from, from that experience and will be very helpful going forward. Yeah, I, I think it's helpful because uh... You know, any kind of uh, statutory legislative guidance is, is really helpful when you're uh, giving judges uh, discretion. And at least for me, you know, all, many, many years ago, 1385 has always been kind of an enigma <laughs> as to what the, uh, the boundaries are. You know, generally the public thinks the judge can do anything and judges are, are very reserved about what they can do and they feel they're always coming out on the limb. Uh, when they do exercise that discretion, since it's so so broad and undefined, so you know whatever guidance can be given in in, the, in 1385, I think is is a good move. Let me just second that and and um, say that I think it really fits squarely within the mission of this um, committee to clarify the, the the penal code. The Supreme Court is. Uh, you say enigma, the actual words that the court has adopted is that it's an amorphous concept, 1385. Same thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> which, you know, which the enigma is enigma shorter. <laughs> yeah, exactly, perhaps. Um, but um, anyway, I also should say a special shout out to uh, Judge Espinosa who testified before the legislature on uh, SB 81, and I think was uh, quite helpful. Also, of course, Senator uh, Kamlager, who used to be on this committee, uh, but until she was promoted to become a senator, and, um, and um, also was uh, instrumental, especially on the gang legislation, um, and showed real leadership and perseverance there. That on um, probably was the most hot button issue that we um, recommended um, in some ways. And um, anyway, I'm ex extremely proud and happy. We've been in constant contact with the governor's office along the way. Uh, I am hopeful and optimistic that all, if not the, the vast majority, if not all of these will be, be signed um, and we'll obviously keep you posted. So thank you all. Um, all right, next I have another exciting uh, announcement. Uh, last week, Governor Newsom appointed uh, US federal judge Felton Henderson to fill the open committee seat. Um, judge Henderson spoke before the committee last year and I believe deeply impressed us all. He certainly impressed and inspired me. Um, he, you know, his resume is, you know, uh, speaks for itself from his work in the civil rights movement to his teaching and his experience in as a federal judge. Um, 
especially relevant here is that he, among other things, he presided over the landmark uh, civil rights litigation involving prison conditions and overcrowding in California's prisons uh, for decades. So um, he's really a true expert and um, will be a great addition. Unfortunately, and he's very much looking forward to working with us all. Unfortunately, given the short notice, his appointment just became effective last week. Um, he was not available to join us today. Um, but I look forward to having him and I know that he's enthusiastic to join us. Um, next, I want to uh, approve the minutes from the July meeting. Uh, can someone second approving the, those minutes? Second. Any objections? Nope. All right, all in favor? All right, good. All right. Uh, those minutes are approved. Uh, and then my final piece of administrative business is that I'm very happy to announce also thanks to the legislature. You know, we had some, you know, substantive victories, but also we had, um, I guess, an administrative victory in that uh, two, uh, the legislature approved two new um, positions for the committee, two new lawyers to join our committee. Um, right now, our staff is doing an amazing job, but they are working on borrowed time and extra hours and whatever the appropriate metaphor is, doing a bang up job, but we're only gonna be better. Uh, so the, and the job posting was just approved. I think Tom has distributed or will distribute it. Please get it out to your networks of folks who might be interested. This is this. We have two uh, openings. This one is for the, the first one will be for a relatively senior um, attorney, um, and um, you know we hope to. We'll, I'm sure we'll get great applications, but please spread the word if you have anybody who you think. Uh, would be interested, they can apply through the committee website um, or by reaching out to Tom. All right, any questions on anything I've just gone through with the, those administrative issues? Awesome. All right, um, now I'd like to introduce um, the folks um, from CPL, the California Policy Lab. Um, so this is the substance of our meeting and I'd just like to welcome folks that uh, staff and I have been working, uh, working with for months um, and it's a really exciting part of this work and my work at Stanford, and, and I'm just thrilled to be working with them. Um, we've been working extremely hard on negotiating agreements to, to, to get the data from um, other uh, state agencies, organizing and cleaning the data and beginning a sophisticated analysis that will lead directly to the committee's work. Um, and this is really being shouldered by the California, by the folks at the Policy Lab and the folks um, that are, you'll hear from in a minute. Um, I should mention that this work is generously supported by Arnold Ventures and the Just Trust, two foundations that support in our work, and we appreciate their support and encouragement. Um, but of course, those uh, foundations and bodies obviously play no role in setting our research agenda or have any substantive input uh, on the work that we're doing. So uh, with that, uh, let me just introduce who, we're, who have, we have on the screen. Uh, we're joined by Steve Raphael and Mia Bird, both of whom have previously appeared before the committee on different topics, but thank, thank you and welcome back. And we're also gonna be joined by their colleagues, Molly Pickard, uh, Omer Gill, and Omer Gill. And I think that that's, is that the whole team? Okay. Great, uh, with that, Molly, can you take us away? Yes, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, hey everybody. Um, so first off, good morning and thank you so much for having us. Um, I will be presenting today the first half of this and then Steve will be taking over to give more of a substantive idea of what we'll be working on. Um, so to start us off, um, go over a little bit about California Policy Lab. So overall, our mission is to improve the lives of Californians by working with government to generate evidence that transforms public policy. Um, we do this by forming lasting partnerships between California government and the state's flagship universities to harness the power of rigorous research and administrative data. Um, so for the sake of the committee, we will be focusing primarily on criminal legal policies, uh, but CPL as a whole also focuses on labor and employment, homelessness and high needs populations, social safety net, education and health. Um, but also, as you all know, these things all intersect with the criminal legal world. So we will be focusing on all of this as it pertains to the committee. So also more broadly, what we do at CPL um, with our government agency partnerships. Uh, we develop research agendas, 
We clean, link, and analyze data. We also conduct our own research. So some of the data that we work with comes directly from the partnerships that we make. And then other data comes from research that we conduct ourselves with focus groups or surveys, um, things of that nature. And then we also engage in long-term collaborative learning with other uh, members of the UC system, um, connect other resources and partners. So a lot of what we do is we try to bring together organizations that uh, might otherwise be siloed. A lot of government agencies, as I'm sure you're all aware, get siloed very quickly. So we aim to bring people together and uh, work with organizations to give people a more broad view of what's happening with our data and policies in California. Um, and then with this, building long-term research infrastructure. So we hope to act as a data hub for a lot of these agencies, um, hosting data that other agencies can work with. But for the sake of this project, uh, the only people with access to this data are the people that are on this um, project on this team. So our work specifically with the committee, um, we are working to generate research that will inform committee policy recommendations. So as uh, Mike gave a little preview, we are working to clean, link, and analyze administrative data. Um, and administrative data refers to data that was originally collected for organizational or administrative purposes. So data that was not collected for the purpose of research, but just for the, the sake of running an organization, um, but that is now being used for research purposes. So for this work, we're working primarily with the Department of Justice and the CDCR, Department of uh, Rehabilitation and Corrections, CDCR, Corrections and Rehabilitation. Um, so we're also designing studies to address key committee questions. Uh, synthesizing existing policy and relevant research findings, so uh, paying close attention to other policies that are happening across the nation and seeing how they can be relevant to the policies that we're working with in California, um, presenting our research results and reports to the committee, such as today and right now, um, and then connecting the committee with additional resources and partners. So if there are other agencies that we can work with, um, we hope to facilitate those connections. So here is uh, us. Um, I will just give a quick overview. Mia Bird, um, Joanna Laco, who cannot be here today, Steve Raphael, Omer Gill, and myself, Molly Pickard. Um, and then I'll go over briefly the research agenda and then hand it over to Steve. So what we'll be presenting on today are the three main points in the research agenda that we currently have. However, it is an evolving um, agenda. So we are always working on improving it, updating it, and then um, taking things away that maybe are no longer relevant. Uh, to date, we have the crime trends analysis. Uh, Steve presented, I believe, a few months ago, um, gave a testimony, and we have turned that into a crime brief that was published this morning. Um, Sentencing California is a report that we aim to have out in November of this year is more of a descriptive long report. Um, and then how determinant are California criminal sentences is again another report, um, less descriptive, uh, more causal, hopefully, and that's anticipated for October of 2022. And now I will hand it over to Steve. Well, well, thank you. Good morning, everybody, and, and thanks for having us uh, at, at the hearing and, and uh, hearing our research agenda and partnering with us more generally. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time going over the data that we have access to now and then our planned research agenda uh, for the next year and then all, and, um, and what we're doing. So what we're currently involved in in terms of this project. So as of the moment, we've received detailed information from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation that for the most part is describing the prison population at given points in time. So we have at the moment, I think four uh, or maybe three cross sections that has very detailed information on, on the incarcerated persons themselves. Uh, very, very, very detailed information on their, their sentence, including the specific charges they were convicted of, any conduct and case enhancements that have been uh, levied on the, uh, uh, against mm -hmm. the person, what their credit earnings rates are, when they entered and exited, mm -hmm. and then where uh, they, they were committed from. In addition to this, we've also received data from CDCR that has complete information on every single term that uh, has been served in CDCR since 2015, both terms that have completed and have ended. And that includes not only new commitments, but people who are returned to prison for, for parole violations. And so we just received that data a few weeks ago. And then aside from that, 
We also currently have um, uh, a, a large data pull from the automated criminal history system that is basically the repository for all, all arrests. And then as well, if, you know, although there's issues about uh, whether it's completely reported, information on dispositions of arrests. And that is for the entire state. And we're, we're still trying to get a handle on um, the, the dimensions of that data set, but we believe it covers the last 10 years. And ultimately we'll be able to link the data from CDCR to the DOJ criminal history records and have a, a broad view of people who are currently incarcerated in terms of their criminal histories, as well as people who were, who were previously incarcerated in CDCR. Uh, so Molly, can you go to the next slide, please? So in, ter in terms of our research agenda, we, we have one, one product that, that we're releasing today, and that was what I presented to you last time. And it was simply an analysis of what happened to crime in California between 2019 and 2020, and how it compared to other states. So I, I won't spend a lot of time on this because we talked about it uh, extensively last time. Um, but I, I can say that there's an offshoot project that, that I'm currently working on with a student as well that we hope to have something at some point looking at specifically homicide because since uh, that last presentation, there's been uh, micro data records that have been published by the Department of Justice on, on incidents of homicide. And so we're gonna do some additional work on that as well. Um, next slide, please, Molly. Now, what, what we're most involved with at the moment is we're most uh, um, engaged in trying to understand the structure of sentences uh, for people that are currently incarcerated or under the jurisdiction of CDCR. And in particular, what we're trying to understand is the different components or the different contributors to uh, years uh, of sentences that uh, constitute the criminal sentences of people currently incarcerated. And the way we're thinking about this is we have years that are associated with the base sentence. We have years that are associated with conduct and case enhancements. And then we have the degree to which sentences are shifted by someone having a second strike or a third strike. And given the detail of what we have in, uh, in the CDCR data, we're actually able to see each one of those components individually and say how important they are, right? In terms of the, the total years of sentence that, that individuals are getting to, to state prisons, as well as the total years that the population cumulatively is bearing and tie it to the specific penal codes and, um, and, uh, and sentencing practices. Now, we've, we've been um, sort of neck deep in this data for about the last month, and, and we were hoping to have um, some tabs to share today, but we, we wanna make sure that everything is right before before we present it publicly, but we can share, you know, what we're some of the degree of what we're seeing in the data, and that's namely that for case and and offense enhancements, there are a few of them that are are more frequent than others, right? Just despite the fact that there are literally like 160 different offense enhancements and and I think a couple of dozen different types of case enhancements there's really you know, 10 or 15 that are doing, uh, that are the most frequent and contribute the most years. So for example, prior felony conviction for a serious offense, prior prison terms, the one years, even though those were, were eliminated, people who have those in the past, you see those quite frequently in data, where for offense enhancements, um, you know, use of firearm, inflicting uh, grave bodily injury, the 1020 life enhancements and the gang enhancements are the ones that you see uh, quite frequently. And ultimately what we're, what we're hoping to do with this project is to have a, a sort of solid accounting of essentially what the contributors are to sentences in, in the state and be able to kind of apportion um, uh, relative weights to those different categories and, and, and have a very clear kind of view of, of what, what adds the most. So I'm in a, in a construction zone, I apologize for that. Um, aside from that, uh, that, you know, we also plan on spending time trying to understand how things vary by county. Are some counties more likely to use enhancements uh, relative to others? We can explore whether enhancements co-vary with, with race and ethnicity and the extent to which uh, differences can be explained by differences in criminal histories or differences in uh, the, the controlling or the underlying offense or case characteristics. And so that's on the agenda for this report. 
Um, uh, and then on top of that, we can also see what proportion of the population will be there for really short stays. Uh, and what are the characteristics of, uh, of, that, of that population. We'll be able to look at people who are eligible for prison simply because of, of the content of their past uh, offenses. And then ultimately we do, uh, I don't know if we'll be able to get this done for the November 2021 report, but we would like to do some um, kind of quasi-experimental quasi analysis of the link between enhancements and recidivism with the idea being uh, we can find two otherwise similar people, for example, one who uh, their conduct was or their, their mm -hmm. offense was enhanced with a second strike and others who were eligible for a second strike and didn't get that enhancement. Mm -hmm. And we can you know, find differences in how much time they're serving. We can look at differences in uh, new arrests and new convictions that occurred during the period when the people who would have got who would have been incarcerated under the second strike weren't, and perhaps we can say something about incapacitation, uh, uh, deterrence effects, and perhaps criminogenic effects. Right, those are the the sort of three categories that criminologists tend to use to think about uh, the relationship between um, sentencing and uh, and and criminal activity post release. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the, um, the next project, which is kind of a longer term project that we, we would like to engage in, and we believe that they'll, they will feed into one another, is um, sort of based on a framing that of, of sentencing in California that was articulated by a, a legal scholar named Kevin Reitz. And that is namely that he's pointed out that in California, despite the fact that we have a determinate sentencing system with, with some degree of indeterminacy, there's actually a lot of indeterminacy in the sentencing that we're giving out as determinate sentencing. And that largely comes from the fact that people can earn credits. And so the, the earliest date that they can be released is, is quite different from the latest date that they can be released. And it's to some degree dependent on whether or not they earn those credits. And then also uh, with the passage of Prop 57, the milestone credits, the ability for administrative parole review for, for certain inmates that have um, uh, uh, not been convicted of certain offenses and that have case enhancements that extend their sentence way beyond uh, the, um, their, their base terms are eligible for, for administrative review and that adds determinacy. And so what we would like to do is, is study that process, right? Try to see, you know, to what degree actually is there, you know, uh, 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 or what is the degree of determinacy that we see with the different, I guess, buckets of sentences that people can possibly get? What is the rate at which people earn credits? Do they tend to earn all their credits? Do they tend to earn not that many of their credits? Is it somewhere in the middle? And how much heterogeneity is there? How much time do people actually serve? Um, for for sentences of of, uh, of given terms, and then of course we can um, look at the effects of things like program participation, uh, um, prison misconduct, you know whether serious rules violations and so on and so forth are impacting uh, the the rate at which people are earning the credits, and then ultimately what what the relationship is between um, this level of indeterminacy and the move towards greater indeterminacy and uh, post-release outcomes, right? So are people doing better or worse when they are incentivized to, uh, to program and to, and to earn credits at a higher rate? Uh, ne next slide, please, Molly. And then, and then finally, um, you know, we envision our role with, with the committee as actually being quite interactive. So we've laid out a, a few projects that we're working on that are, are you know, they, they have a, a structure, they have a plan, and, and they're things that we're going to be producing. But we meet regularly uh, with, with staff members, and we are trying to develop ideas with them and also think about ways that we as researchers and, and people who have access to this extraordinary amount of administrative data can support uh, the, the work of the, of the committee staff. So, um, you know, that will involve developing long-term projects, responding to short-term needs, um, uh, studying the effects of past committee recommendations, and then, you know, perhaps the most fun part for us is actually we have access to this, you know, to this staff of, of brilliant attorneys, right, who can help us understand what we're seeing and, and sort of guide research. So we have a very 
nice, uh, at least uh, from my point of view, symbiotic uh, relationship with the staff where um, we're learning uh, quite a bit from them and I hope that we can contribute as well. I just want to emphasize as well that, you know, for us as researchers, this is an amazing opportunity, right? So it, it really is a huge lift to have, you know, first of all, to, to put these data sharing agreements into place, to be able to work with CDCR who have been um, uh, very supportive and responsive when we have questions of them, to have access to DOJ, to be able to link these things and to um, be so close to the policy process, right? To the point where we can, you know, take our skills or, or what we have to contribute and, uh, you know, try to make it as, as relevant as possible to, to, to your deliberations. And so we have these longer term goals. And of course, you know, researchers always wanna write papers and get publications, but we also, you know, want to, to be responsive and, uh, and relevant and, and develop our, um, our research partnership in a way that's productive and, and uh, beneficial to everybody. So that's, that's it. That's what we got to say, and, and I'm, I'm happy to respond to any question. Um, I'm going to be very interested in seeing the information on the sentencing patterns by different counties. Um, it's not necessarily part of the penal code penal code in terms of differences in the penal code, but I think at least um, some past data would indicate that there's some pretty uh, large disparities or differences. And uh, it would be interesting to see whether certain counties are driving certain sentencing patterns. And we, we do have information on county of commitment both in the DOJ data as well as in, in the CDCR information. And one, one thing that we didn't mention is, or I, I believe it was a bullet point there, perhaps I forgot, is you know, we can also, given that we have the full uh, um, universe of felony arrests in the state with DOJ, we can actually see where the dividing line is between you know, arrests that graduate into a prison sentence and arrests that are diverted somewhere else, right? Whether they're wobbler or otherwise. And are we gonna get that data also? What we, we do have, we have it already. And so the, the, our, our task now is to figure out how to merge the CDCR records to, to DOJ. Although you can in, in the automated criminal history files from DOJ, you can see arrests with a disposition that result in a prison sentence. Uh -huh. And then the other issue you raised about the, you know, that we have, our sentences are more indeterminate than one would, would um, assume on paper because of things like the credit system and such. Um, I wonder if our data, you know, obviously during the period of the pandemic, which is now has been going on for what, good long time, uh, 600 days or so odd. Um, the uh, CDCR suspended many of the programs that would allow um, an incarcerated individual to get credit. Additionally, um, we discovered that there were not good records kept in certain of the facilities. So uh, I don't mean to say that the data won't be valid, but I wonder if, if you have factor, if you, in the commenting on it in your report, if you can include any um, information regarding that so that we can, in weighing the data, weigh it knowing uh, you know, these other variables that may affect um, what we're seeing. Yeah, well, we can, uh, that's a good question. We could certainly um, request to go back in time for previous cross sections and try to see whether there's less programming or the credit earnings rates drop from pre-pandemic to post-pandemic. Um, it, it, is, it is kind of, when, when you actually get into the, to the data that we have, the detail is pretty, pretty amazing, right? So as opposed to say, you know, survey data that exists nationally for prisoners where you have a, you know, very few fields, we have a record of every single recorded you know, uh, um, kind of administrative transaction that's happening uh, in the system. And so presumably if it's recorded, we can see it. Now, I, I don't know if, if 
I, I'll have to think about this question about whether record keeping uh, was was less than perfect or, or whether we can see that because of course it would be impossible for us to say that um, you know we're not seeing things that actually happened unless we had another benchmark you know uh, set of cases against which we can compare them. But we we'll, we will follow up and perhaps and it's broken you. down by facility. If if you're able to, then that might give us some information. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, we could, we could, I, yeah. I believe we have information on, on facility that people are incarcerated in. Okay. Okay. I had um, <clears throat> a question and Mia, maybe you can help us explore this a little bit. Um, this is a lot of data as we know, but it's, it seems like in our discussions that we're still missing um, things that are fairly important. And I, and I know you've done a lot of work with getting that county level data. Um, you know, for example, what does this tell us sort of about the, the jail population from what we're able to say, or is there more uh, work we need to do to, to sort of understand what's happening in, in the jails in each of the counties? It's a great point, Tom. Um, it kind of depends on the question we're interested in asking. So we can see information on sentencing to jail, and that's really helpful. So to understand who's getting sentenced to jail, what the length of the sentences are, and really allows us to look at that full population that's being convicted, say, of a felony offense, and then look across counties on the distribution of the type of at the distribution of the type of sentence. So, you know, in some counties are more people going to prison and jail, and in other counties are more people getting probation. So we can look at the sentence distribution. What we can't see that's really helpful is the actual time spent in jail. So the length of stay in jail. And we also can't see much information about pretrial release. And so I think that's increasingly an issue of interest. And so thinking about how we might bring in jail data in the future in order to answer some of the additional questions. And then also we can't see in the DOJ data, we can't see the trajectory of the case in terms of that from arrest to filing charges. So we're not able to distinguish between arrests that did not result in charges being filed and arrests that did result in charges being filed. And that's really important in thinking about sort of the role of the DA in the overall criminal legal system. And so information from DA's offices would also be helpful in, in understanding that. And then lastly, I think, you know, there's a lot of interest in programming at CDCR, but there's a lot of programming that happens at the county level too. And so at some point in the future, that may become of interest to, count, to the committee. And right, um, and is this, and we still don't have insight into sort of probation violations unless they hit court. Is that right, or what are we able to say about sort of that dynamic? We understand that the DOJ data isn't great at capturing necessarily capturing all of that information. So we have we know that we have arrests, but depending on how people are booked into jail we may be missing some of the violations that result in a, re a rebooking into jail. And so the jail data would help us to use both sources to really better understand what's happening at the local level. Hmm. The, the one thing I would add, Tom, is we do for the, for the incarcerated, for the people incarcerated in CDCR, we can see their, their uh, prior jail stays while they were awaiting adjudication. So we can see that. And, you know, and then the other thing is we, we did just recently get a massive term file from CDCR. And if people are being returned to custody on a parole violation, we can see all of those uh, where they're returned to custody without a new term. And then also people who are returned to custody with, a, with a, um, you know, with a new term. I think in the, in the DOJ, so in the automated criminal history files, one thing that, that I've observed in past projects and I think this was much more of a pre-realignment phenomena than than uh, than we would see now. Is there was actually a, a you know a small but not insubstantial fraction of people who would be arrested by a parole officer, returned to a, to custody of CDCR in a reception center, and then they would never you would never see an arrest in uh, the ACHS because they would literally be dropped off in a prison, right? I, that's probably doesn't happen as much anymore, given that the volume of returns based on paroles is just much lower than it was in past years. But I think the fact that we have both, we now we have the terms files and the ACHS that we'll be able to capture, we'll be able to capture that. Looks like Judge Espinoza has a question too. I have a question for Mia. Um, 
Uh, our department in Los Angeles County has been involved in two projects uh, around the jail. One was the uh, work group that created a report that guided the Board of Supervisors on a plan to close Men's Central Jail. And the other is more current, it's called the Jail Population Review Council. And it's a collaboration of stakeholders that's reviewing data on how the population was reduced during COVID and keeping an eye on the slow and steady increase back to the old numbers. One of the partners in that work is the Vera Institute in Los Angeles. They've created a dashboard that, that will tell you almost on a weekly basis who's in the jail, why they're there, and all of the... I Do you work with the, the Vera Institute at all? Not directly, but I'm going to reach out to them now. <laughs> yeah, the, the, person, the person you want to reach out to is Michelle Paris. If you send me only because I'm a Luddite, this is how I know how to do it. If you send me an email, I will then inter I can introduce you to Michelle. She'll be very unbelievably knowledgeable about the data around the largest county jail in the country. So that's great. I've actually worked with. Um, right now, we're trying to look at a similar question in some different counties throughout the state. So, what happened in terms of jail populations? during the COVID period, you know, what, what did the changes in the com composition of the populations look like? How did the size change? And do we see any public safety implications? So we're trying to bring in counties right now at CPL to ask a similar question. And yeah. as part of the multi-county study, when we had those 12 counties of jail and probation data, LA County was one of those counties. Okay. So I could give you I could give you two hours on what happened during COVID, but I would just say the population was reduced by more than thirty percent um, within a three month period, and there were lots of strategies that um, contributed to that reduction. But if if you can just contact me, I want to introduce you to Michelle because I think she'll be very helpful to you. That sounds great. Thank you. You're welcome. Looks like Professor Ochin has her hand up too. Uh, thank you. I, I have a just a really quick question about uh, demographic data, and I apologize if you've already mentioned this, and also for my dog. Um, but uh, I'm wondering if you have intersectional data on population uh, uh, custodial populations or populations that have come into contact with law enforcement across the state, and by that I mean. Uh, overlapping between, say, race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, something of, of that sort. Are you able to uh, evaluate the data through, through that lens? I know at times that can be difficult, and I'm wondering if um, you're able to do so with the data sets that you have. Uh, well, indeed, yes. Um, well, for some of those dimensions, yes, because our data is at the micro level. So we have inmate by inmate, and in some instances, inmate by term. And so we can look at the intersection between race and gender. I, I, I'm not sure about gender identity. I don't think I saw a flag for that or any, any kind of information on that. But there are other, other dimensions that we can look at. So there are, you know, there are several indicators of mental health status um, and mental illness that we can interact. We have age. Um, so we do have quite a bit in terms of the, the you know, sort of, basic demographics of each individual involved, more so in CDC in the CDCR than in the ACHS and the DOJ data. And we can look at all of those dimensions and we will. Thank you. Unless anybody has any further questions, um, I just wanted to wrap this piece up uh, with just a few observations of my own and appreciation really for Steve and um, his team. Um, a couple of, uh, of notes. First, uh, that we didn't really mention the security protocols that's been going on uh, to protect this data and make sure that we are exceeding all state and federal rules and regulations to ensure that all the data that we received is um, secure. And obviously we have a bunch of sensitive uh, data and this involves fingerprinting and, and a whole lot of um, data security that um, I won't go into now, but please, uh, everybody should be assured that we're really uh, careful about that and realize how sensitive the, the data is. Second, I just want I just need, need, want people to know, you know, we've been working for, for a long time on this. Um, 
that my understanding is that this is, you know, what we currently have is the, probably the largest and most detailed collection of data related to uh, criminal legal system in California history. Um, and then given the size of California, uh, maybe the largest data set of its kind in the, in the country. Um, and actually we're still, my, my impression after speaking with, you know, everybody's, we're still even getting our arms around what we have and what we can do with it and what would be the most productive uh, use for this committee. But it's certainly a, a very long-term project um, for us as the committee to, to use this uh, data and in partnership with um, CPL. Um, and, you know, they're being too modest, but um, you all should know that CPL is, you know, first of all, they're extraordinarily uh, um, easy and, and um, friendly to work with. But also their national reputation is peerless. I mean, when we go around and talk to foundations or others around the country to talk about what we're doing or other uh, similar committees, um, you know, there, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's no one better to be doing this work with us. We just are fortunate enough that they are in our backyard. So um, we're very proud in that. And, and we're, this is, you know, really um, leading edge work uh, nationally and I hope becomes a model um, beyond, beyond our work. Um, as, as some of you know, this was a goal that we announced or that uh, on day one uh, of the formation of this committee is to really be driven as much as possible by data and evidence. Um, and that that is a, that the criminal legal system and the laws that we've developed to, so far and really the state and country history um, around these laws have unfortunately lacked that kind of data and evidence and have been driven instead more by anecdote, emotion and politics. Um, and you know, I think that that's a real core mission of our committee is to try to uh, bring as much evidence as possible to, to bring about the fairest and most effective um, criminal legal system in the world. Um, so, you know, in, in the end, I just think that this is a tremendous, re you know, the data and CPL um, is a tremendous resource for the committee. Um, we hope for the administration and just the state uh, generally. So I'm incredibly appreciative and proud. And so um, thank you all. This is a long ongoing process and conversation that is, you know, just beginning. So um, members, please, you know, we can continue after this conversation online and offline. And, uh, you know, let's just try to figure out the best way to, to, to use this and um, use these resources that, that, that we've been given to, 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 to do our work. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. So thank you all. Um, I wanna take a, unless there are any final thoughts or questions, I wanna take a um, seven minute break uh, until 10 o'clock and then we'll uh, kick off our uh, presentation on the committee recommendations. So any last words? All right, thank you, Steve, Mia, everyone, Molly. Uh, it's great to see you and uh, thank you all. So we'll reconvene at 10 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.
Hi, if everyone could come back and turn on their screens. I got a message from Senator Skinner that she is gonna be detained for about 10 or 15 minutes. So she'll have to play catch up, um, but she's a quick learner. Um, I think Rick and, and Lara it would, might be helpful to have your screens on if it's helpful, yeah. Pete, that that works for you guys. Um, all right, so um, welcome back everyone. Uh, this is the main course of today's uh, event agenda. Um, we're, we're here to discuss the potential recommendations to adopt and further develop for our annual report, uh, for a second annual report. Uh, committee staff will walk us through a PowerPoint presentation outlining the highlights of each recommendation for our discussion. Each recommendation was explained in more detail in the staff memo, which was distributed earlier this week. Uh, and of course, all the recommendations originate from our discussions and deliberations uh, at hearings earlier over the course of the year. Please note that by law, we can only vote on these recommendations after hearing from public comment. So uh, I encourage you all to raise questions, concerns, thoughts, suggestions um, during Tom's presentation, uh, but we can't uh, formally vote until uh, after afterwards. I also wanna emphasize while we're making substantive decisions and recommendations today, the committee will publish a full report with detailed analysis, updated data, charts and research, likely sometime in December. So this will be, and, and just a footnote, this will be separate from and in addition to our report on the death penalty. So a draft on our final report will be made public before our next committee meeting, which will hopefully be in November, and the committee will vote to approve, reject, or modify that final report at the time. So just to reiterate on the procedure, today we're going to vote on the substantive recommendations. And then at our next meeting, we will vote to adopt the final report, which will describe and elaborate on those recommendations. Does anybody have any questions about the just procedure? Okay, good. Um, so at this time, I'd like to hand it over to our legal director, Tom Nosowitz, uh, to get us started. Let's do it. So I've got some slides here. Let me make these and big in these for everybody. So like Mike said, you know, stop me any time with questions or if, you know, we want to go back and look at any of this information or anything. But uh, we've got eight recommendations to cover and we'll just march through them one by one um, and discuss. And this will uh, follow pretty closely what was in the staff memo. Um, so the first, I just, uh, a little bit of a roadmap. So we've got eight total. The first three, for the most part, would require either a voter initiative or two thirds uh, vote in the legislature. So they're uh, bigger lifts than some of the things you've recommended in, in the past. And we can discuss that if anybody wants to, why that's the case. So number one is about life without parole sentences. Um, and the headline is to abolish or create review processes or give judges greater discretion uh, when imposing these sentences. So the current law today is that life without parole is required in a first degree murder conviction. If uh, someone is not going to get the death penalty, they're going to get life without parole. And judges don't have any power to dismiss the special circumstances, which are the, the facts, um, the allegations that lead to these uh, those types of sentences. There's Penal Code 1385.1 that was added by a voter initiative that prevents them from doing that. Uh, and right now, BPH, the Board of Parole Hearings, um, doesn't do any kind of review for people who have these kind of sentences, even though there were regulations uh, in the past that were repealed in 1994 that gave them the, um, that created a process for them to do that. So the again, the uh, headline proposals are to just abolish life without parole entirely to say it's not an appropriate sentence in the state of California, or uh, some more middle of the road proposals would be to give judges the power back to dismiss the special circumstances that they can no longer do under 1385.1 or to uh, say that BPH should have a, the review process for people serving these sentences similar to what they had in the past. And, you know, the, again, to bottom line this, it would, we would not have people doing the rest of their lives uh, in prison. And, you know, as we've discussed many times, I think at every meeting, the older people get, the less likely they are to commit new offenses. And that, you know, comes into particular play with sentences of, of this type. 
So a few data panels to sort of situate us a little bit. So this is the overall CDCR population. You can see about 5% of the people in prison today are there with life par parole sentences, more than 5,000 people. So it's a significant um, number of people serving these most extreme sentences. And if you look at the demographics of people who are serving life without parole, almost 80% are people of color, are non-white. So um, we see the racial disparities that we sort of see throughout the system there. But if we zoom in a little bit more and we look at the age people were when they convict, uh, committed the offense that led to these sentences, uh, you can see that more than half of them were young when they committed these offenses. So 62% were 25 or under at the time of the offense. And if we zoom in, this is the last data panel, don't worry for this one. If we zoom in a little bit more on that population who was under 25 when they committed the offense that led to life without parole, the racial disparities ramp up significantly, I think. And we're looking at 86% uh, of those people who were young um, when they committed these offenses are, are people of color. Yes, Professor Ocean. Are you able to further break down the non-white population? Yes, we have that information. Um, you know, CDCR keeps track of this. They have uh, the uh, ethnicity categories they have are black, Hispanic, white, and other. So we can get a little more detailed uh, than that. But I was just sort of keeping it at that top line here, but we, we certainly have that. Uh, so here's our slide about the uh, possible recommendations again. So this is essentially what I uh, said at the start. Abolish, let courts have power to dismiss the special circumstances. Uh, we could also let people go back to court, uh, ask for a second look after a certain period of time to see whether the life without parole sentence is still appropriate and require BPH to review people serving this sentence as they have done in the past. Um, and we could put a little detail on what that review should look like. And it would basically be borrowed from the existing context that CDCR has when looking at recommending people for resentencing and uh, looking for what they call exceptional conduct. And obviously um, that release wouldn't pose a danger to public safety. Now, so all of those except for the BPH review would take a voter initiative or two thirds vote. In fact, abolishing, I think, would require a voter initiative because of the way um, that law was originally created. Mm -hmm. The BPH review, BPH could do that on their own, or it, I believe it could be done with a majority vote in the legislature. So that's the uh, life of that parole situation. I have a question about the BPH regulatory process. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't need to be necessarily exceptional conduct. We could just say that. BPH should, could recommend people for whatever reason. Absolutely. Yeah. And the other is, is that this is just a rec this would just be a review by BPH to then be a recommendation to the governor for clemency. Or does BPH have any authority on its own to grant parole or otherwise? Or is it merely just a recommendation to the governor to grant? That's right, and I should have been more uh, explicit about that. It just would be to review cases to then refer them to the governor for uh, that person to consider granting clemency. But it would you know, provide a record and a sense of hope and structure for the folks serving these sentences that there might be some change to their situation. And some guidance, I presume, to the governor who has in the past given, their, I mean, we heard from two people who had life without parole sentences and they re obviously received clemency and were able to be released. So right. they, it, wasn't, it wasn't through this process, it was through the ordinary clemency process, which is sort of undefined. Is that right, Tom? That's my understanding. Okay. And Tom, one of the, see if I'm on, Tom, one of the things you suggest in terms of, um, you know, the option of, uh, of uh, giving the court or even uh, BPH to, to guide them is, you know, raising the age. Uh, I think that's prescribed in Senate Bill 9, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the age 25, and that seems like a, a nice compromise and also to uh, require uh, a minimum uh, term of actual service of 25 years. I think those two things can be uh, adjusted. Uh, you know, I, I think abolishing it is kind of a non-starter. <laughs> uh, so I think we really have to focus on, on your uh, alternatives, even though I think that, you know, one of the things I, I've always believed in, and I think I mentioned this when we had the DA 
uh, ADA before us is that there are just too many special circumstances. Well, I think you say there are 24, uh, so that virtually any first degree murder can be alleged with a special circumstance enhancement. So, you know, I, I think uh, that's another approach to reduce the number of special circumstance eligible uh, offenses. Uh, I don't have any specific ideas as to how to go about that. I just think there, <laughs> uh, there are too many. So, uh, and then on BPH, I didn't know that much uh, about that, but rather than, you know, limiting it to exceptional conduct, I think incorporating the age of the person uh, when they committed uh, the offense and also combined with kind of a minimum term of actual service you should guide them in in releasing or granting parole because when you when you think about it you know a, a, a convicted person that you know of a young age to condemn them to you know a life without parole and i've sentenced a number of people to life without parole it's pretty it's uh uh pretty overwhelming experience when you know mm. that age factors in impulsiveness, that people change, uh, but combined with the fact that there are too many special circumstance allegations in the first place, and it's not too hard to get those <laughs> proven. You know, the judge is faced with, hey, what's, uh, there's gotta be some discretion uh, allowed for the judge uh not to condemn someone you know for 50 years or to the end of their their lifespan so I, i'm in favor of some alternative and just say that abolishing it non-starter because in some cases it may be appropriate in you know certain places i mean i think it's most used where you know there's a death penalty sentence imposed and and this is the alternative mm -hmm. that the court will will do. I know a number of judges, maybe Peter has, has reduced a death penalty sentence to uh, life without parole. So those are my thoughts. Professor Ochin. Uh, thank you. I, I, uh, I, I, I hear I would disagree uh, with, with um, Justice Moreno. I think the committee should adhere to our prior discussions regarding a recommendation to abolish life without parole. Um, uh, and certainly that it should not be mandatory uh, as a result of a conviction for first degree murder. I do agree with Justice Moreno that uh, in addition to that, as we may pursue a strategy of incrementalism, if that is the strategy, uh, that we do reduce uh, the number of uh, special circumstances uh, or, or um, uh, yeah, essentially special circumstances that could lead to a first degree murder conviction that would trigger uh, a life without parole sentence. So I think we should pursue both strategies. I don't think we should pursue an either or. Um, and so uh, while I disagree on the, 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 the former, uh, which is that we should pull back from the recommendation regarding abolish life without parole, I think we should pursue a strategy around reducing uh, the opportunities for it to be imposed. Yeah, I also wanted to, um push back with respect a bit on Judge Moreno, what you're saying about non-starter. I don't know, I'm not quite sure if you meant it politically or just as a matter of policy. I would, I would say a couple of things. First of all, uh, I don't think anybody's endorsing, um, let everybody with uh, LWAP sentences uh, be released. But instead, um, what L LWAP really does is it eliminates any, I mean, by its words, eliminates any chance of uh, redemption, rehabilitation, or, or earning release. And that dangerous people would, obviously we uh, would remain behind bars as they do with ordinary typical uh, life sentences. And I was also, from a political standpoint, um, I was actually surprised and encouraged that the representative from the um, District Attorneys Association who herself actually was the is the president of the LA Deputy District Attorneys Association, which is even for more, um, um, I think, 
stronger toward on the law enforcement spectrum. Uh, endorsed, maybe is a strong word, but suggested that she would support some way for after some period of time for people to be able to have those sentences reviewed either by court, there's a discussion about whether they'd be re reviewed by court or by uh, a, a parole board. In my mind, whether or not that that eliminates LWAP, but if everybody gets a review of their sentence at one time or another, I think we're almost playing with semantics at that point. Um, and so I was encouraged just from a political perspective um, that you know she seemed to think that that was a, you know, a reasonable thing to explore. Um, now, all this would require a two thirds vote. So I appreciate that that's a super heavy lift. Um, again, aside from the uh, regulations, but, um, and, 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 and to Professor Ochen's point, I think that we have to figure out as, as a committee, do we, how do we approach, you know, do we, do we make recommendations as we would see in an, an ideal world? What do we, or do we try to make recommendations that are politically realistic and how do we strike that balance um, between incre incrementalism and maybe the uh, far, you know, what our ideals um, scenario might be. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to point that out, but I was particularly, like I said, I was particularly encouraged that, you know, the president of what I can see, see is perhaps the strongest uh, law enforcement heavy organization in the state did seem to suggest that some sort of review after a period of time um, might be an appropriate um, response, which in my mind would um, be a big, um, I don't know what the right word to say is, but a big um, movement away from uh, life parole. If you did have, if you did have a chance uh, to have your uh, sentence reconsidered after time, um, Senator Skinner. Um, yeah, so I, um, Justice Moreno, if you don't mind, if I ask you the question, I, in hearing your um, comments, I interpret or I heard them. And correct me if I'm wrong, that you were indicating that you didn't feel it was appropriate to abolish life without parole, but you didn't speak against the concept of having a review of um, that sentence, either under certain condition, what, whatever you, I didn't hear you articulate what condition, no. but if you could explain, you don't mind explaining a little more what your thought is on that. That what I heard was not that you were opposed to different options regarding this, but rather that you didn't support the abolishing the ability for a judge to provide that sentence. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think if, if we examined each of the special circumstances, uh, you know, the one I raised with the DA was lying in wait. And I think I wrote either a, a concurring or dissenting opinion on this. You know, virtually any premeditated murder could be construed to be lying in wait. So to me, that's an overreach. And there are a number of other uh, special circumstance allegations that I think were just uh, a reaction to a specific, you know, uh, uh, murder that captured the public's uh, or, or the media's imagination. They're kind of reactive in nature. So, so in the first instance, I think that those special circumstances can really be drastically uh, uh, reduced. And what I meant about uh, non-starter, I mean, I, you know, maybe I'm, I'm being more of a uh, pragmatist as opposed to an idealist. Uh, uh, I, I just don't think that there's a real uh, interest, whether it's before the electorate or the or the legislature, legislature, to have uh, that for the legislature that kind of scrutiny if they voted to. Uh, abolish life without parole because I think frankly you know in the whole death penalty uh, discussions that's often posed as as a suitable you know more humane alternative uh, uh, even though there is no death death uh, no executions uh, but I think you know some people uh, deserve to be kept in for, for the rest of their lives for heinous heinous crimes and maybe what Mike was saying that well, in those cases, uh, uh, 
that that uh, they wouldn't be released in any event. So I don't know what you call that. Is that life without parole? So I guess I'm thinking of those extreme cases where uh, that uh, that should be an available uh, sentence. I guess, let me just respond to that. Um, no, what I was saying is that, um, you know, any life, any current indeterminate life sentence, people can and frequently are held yeah. in prison for the rest of their life. Um, I guess my position is, is that um, there should be some mechanism um, and whether we call it abolishing LWAP or not, mm -hmm. um, to uh, earn, your, earn, earn your way out. And whatever earn, earn out means, I'm not quite sure what that, whether it's public safety or some sort of measure of redemption or some length of time that you've already served. Yeah. Um, I think that, especially given the, the numbers of people who are convicted of these crimes at, at a young age and then are mm -hmm. serving 40, 50, 60 years, that at some point it becomes appropriate or that uh, there's a review of that. Now, whether right. there's, now that in some ways is abolishing life without parole if there's a review, right? Because mm -hmm. life without parole is sort of period. So um, perhaps this is just a difference of semantics that we keep life without parole, but we allow for some sort of review of that sentence after some period of time. Right, right. But that's, I think that's my position. Okay, um, um, that, then, then I think that we're more closer, closer than we uh, yeah, are. Yeah. And, I think the political reality is, if, as I said, is if the most conservative, and, and I don't want to, I mean that in the most law enforcement heavy organization seems to think that that's um, leaving a window open to that possibility. Maybe it isn't as far fetched politically as we all might suspect. I do think that the other specter that you raise about it's as an alternative to the death penalty, and that we heard testimony when um, from the experts on the death penalty about states that have, have abolished the death penalty, that in this mm -hmm. sort of um, catch-22 sort of way that keeping LWAP sentences um, increases the likelihood that a state might um, abolish the death penalty. I do think that that, you know, is a very complicating and factor. Um, mm -hmm. But um, so, so I, I appreciate that. And, and I'm trying to, in my mind, separate out those, those two right. um, issues. Um, Judge Espinoza. Yeah, I, I'm going to avoid the viability of abolishing LWAP for the moment and just say that I'm attracted to a number of things that have been discussed today. Carl, Justice Moreno's um, conversation around raising the minimum age to 25, I think is very attractive since what we've learned about brain science and brain development is consistent with the idea that decision making, you know, for people under that age is, is not what it is over that age. The other thing I'm always um, interested in is increasing judicial discretion. I okay. think the idea that judges um, be given the authority to dismiss those special circumstances after trial um, could be very productive. And then the BPH, the BPH recommendation I think is a good one. I, I agree that exceptional conduct um, isn't sufficient direction and guidance. I think it needs to include an evaluation of a, per, a person's current, and I know this is a, an amorphous com concept as well, but um, threat to public safety, but we should be talking about their age, their medical condition, in addition to their um, conduct in prison when considering um, clemency for an LWAP sentence. Thanks. And uh, Judge Espinoza, I just do, I don't want to belabor this point, but there was some back and forth when we heard the testimony about whether or not the appropriate venue for looking back at these sentences would, would be the parole board or uh, a court. Do you have a feeling about that? You know, I, I'd, I'd have to think about that. There was a high profile case in Los Angeles County yesterday that was um, heard for resentencing on a serial rape conviction where the district attorney's office originally said they weren't going to oppose the resentencing in the yeah. head. Um, I don't know. I don't know which venue would be more productive, quite frankly. Um, I, but I'm, I'm happy to think about it and talk about it. All right. And my, I had another question about, um, and maybe this goes to Rick, uh, about just, you know, and, and our earlier conversation about 
do we have, is there good data evidence on the efficacy of LWAP sentences in terms of either deterrent or inc incapacitation or do, is, is there any, can you just fill us in a bit or, or, uh, or do we need to do our own research on that first question? Right, I, I, I don't, I think generally there's evidence that extremely long sentences don't, aren't effective measures in deterring or preventing crime. They're not great for crime prevention. And I, I don't think that's very much contested. The National Academy of Sciences report made that finding years ago. And it, I think that's understood. Specifically, there was a, a, a more recent study about LWAP versus uh, life with the possibility of parole sentences, finding mm -hmm. that they weren't more, that LWAP sentences were not more effective than life with possibility of parole sentences. And I think that goes to Justice Moreno Moreno's point um, and and a question that you know for people sentenced to life with parole there's still a really good chance that they are going to spend the rest of their life in prison especially considering BPH parole grant rates we'll get to that later we'll, we'll get to that later and then also I just wanted to mention that you know you guys are discussing kind of the political viability and how entrenched LWAP sentences are I think what we learned from Professor Seeds when he visited the committee, uh, as well as his written submission, is that you know the life without parole sentence, as we now know it, is relatively new. Um, it's a relatively new development. Um, we are an outlier uh, in, in California's own history. This is new, and we're outlier in, in the rest of the world with that life without parole sentence. So I, th I think maybe it's not, you know, that that sentence isn't as entrenched as we might think it is. I think it's very much a product of the harsh on crime period in the 90s and doesn't really have support much further uh, back than that. Right. All right. Um, and just finally, unless anybody has any questions, I'm just trying to get some context. It's about 5,000 people currently in California with life without parole sentences. I think that there are almost 30,000 people or 25,000 people with life with parole sentences, and then about 700 people on death row. Is that right? So we're talking all told 30, 31,000 people. Is that right in that category? Correct. All right. And, and just to also mention which that, a, which is about a third of the overall prison population. Right. Currently. But and you're, also, you're, you're including with possibility of parole. I mean, if you compare. Yeah. No, 5,000 to the total prison population, it's pretty small. No, no, I was just calling, I was, yeah. no, LWAP, we're right, is, is 5,000, which is 5% right. or 4% of the overall, but I was doing all of the, the life sentences. Life, right. And, and death, and the death. And then there's the racial kind of disparity as well. Yeah, and, and, I, and, and I think the, the, youth, the, the, the combination of youth and, and, and race was particularly, you know, problematic. Right, obviously. right. Um, sorry, did I interrupt you, Rick? Oh, no, I was just going to add a few more data points. So we have the data point that uh, about 61% of people sentenced to LWAP were 25 or under at the time of the offense. Um, almost 40% were 21 or under. So it's, it's really just young young people sentenced to crime. Right. Um, for those people who were uh, in California, people who were 16 to under the age of 18 at the time of the offense can still be sentenced to LWAP. But judges have discretion to impose either an LWAP sentence or a life with the possibility of parole sentence. And that discretion allows juveniles to come back years later and petition for resentencing. And so if this committee was to say that judges do have the ability to dismiss cir special circumstances, then you know even if a court at sentencing did not dismiss special circumstances and instead sentenced a person to LWAP, there would still be a possibility years later to return to court and petition for resentencing, asking the court to dismiss those special circumstances similar to the juvenile process now. But that would require a two thirds vote, is that right, Greg? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions, thoughts, suggestions before we move on to the next? This is obviously a heavy duty uh, subject. We should also just I did before moving on. I want to say we talk about life without parole sentences with you know focusing entirely on the people who are serving those sentences. Obviously, all of those sentences uh, involve our murders, you know, and we should just be you know pretty candid about that. Right. Uh, well, are the harshest crimes. Yes, Senator Skinner. Well, I would like to see the the breakdown, the data that um, 
uh, our previous presenters are collecting for us because, for example, there we had a number of incarcerated individuals who had LWAP due to felony murder. And we've now reformed felony murder. And so I, I guess my point is when we say everyone with LWAP committed murder, we know that that's, they were convicted of murder. They didn't necessarily commit murder. We've made some adjustments to those statutes to give a little more, uh, a more ability for a court to review those circumstances. But I think being able to see the data on age and uh, race would be helpful in terms of what might be the best direction to go, at least for me. So that's one, um, one thing that before I make a recommendation, I would like to see. Uh, additionally, even by county, because if, for example, we saw that, um, I mean, I think we, without trying to already presuppose or assume what the data is, all the other data we've received has shown a racial bias in um, not just sentencing, but in arrest, conviction, sentencing. I would guess that we will see that again in this circumstance, but we may additionally see a disproportionate of these sentences in certain parts of the state versus others sure. as proportionate to the population of the you know, California population, which may be reflective. Now, maybe that's appropriate. Maybe it's reflective of the population of that region. You know, I, I don't know. I think the state should have more uniform, perhaps, approach. Um, yeah, but I think that could inform us some additionally. Um, and then the other thing that's on my mind is, and this is uh, perhaps not within our realm, but I think some, some polling data, some, some indication of public attitude on these options would be helpful. Right. Bringing, you know, we can make a recommendation. However, how something, regardless of what the recommendation is, gets through the legislature is a whole nother um, uh, I don't need to say more. If we look yeah. at all the bills, while well, our chair was correct, that a number of our recommendations that were proposed as statute in this session are now on the governor's desk, they are very different than the recommendations that we adopted. So I know Mike's kick. <laughs> Different. I mean, again, I'm, I'm uh, not trying to go into huge detail, but they vary. So, and that's part of the legislative process. But in something like this, we're talking about some fine distinctions, more than fine, some real distinctions here. And if regardless of which of these we were to adopt, the legislature's adoption of whatever that recommendation would be, would be very different than what we adopted. I, that I can guarantee. Yeah. So um, I think, and again, without having um, some significant either victims groups or law enforcement groups behind it, then uh, it makes it that much harder, if, especially for any of the two thirds votes. So seeing where the public might be is, uh, I think, is helpful because it's not just a law enforcement attitude that governs um, how California legislators um, approach these issues, but also how they feel their constituents might. Yeah, I, I, I agree uh, completely with, with the Senator. And in terms of the county breakdown, in terms of you know these special circumstance allegations or death penalty, you just have to look regionally at, you know, what comes to mind are Riverside, San Bernardino, Kern County, and San Mateo. Yes. So yes. whether or not you get those allegations filed is largely a function of, you know, where you commit where the crime you and, who charges, and who charges you, yeah. Right. 
Yeah, and 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 and, and you know the two thirds, you know we may think that that's not uh, a significant threshold, but this is the kind of issue where I mean, uh, I'm not a legislator, but they they look at their constituents to see, uh, you know, whether or not something like this. Uh, uh, how it's going to be received by their constituents. And as we've said earlier, LWAP is seen as a suitable alternative to the death penalty. Uh, that's just a fact of life. So I think we need that kind of information, whether we are prag pragmatists or idealists. Professor Ochin. Uh, so um, my question uh, follows along the lines of uh, some of the sort of data that uh, Senator Skinner was asking about. Um, during our testimony about LWAP, we heard from folks who had formerly been serving LWAP sentences and had been granted clemency. I believe one or two of them were women. Uh, and I would be interested, and we have a disproportionate number of uh, women who are serving life with and without parole sentences in the state of California, many of whom were charged on theories of accomplice liability. Yeah. So in addition to um, information about felony murder, race, and age, I would also like uh, the committee, if possible, to get information about gender. Um, if there are allegations of domestic violence or, or, or gender-based violence um, and the theory uh, of guilt, uh, whether it's felony murder, accomplice liability, I think that would be helpful as well. The other question that I have um, is was was uh, triggered by a comment that Justice Moreno just made, which is about the process um, by which uh, different counties are using when they uh, allege special circumstances. And I don't know the process, so I guess I'm asking a question. Is um, I understand in some jurisdictions there are committees um, uh, that, uh, determine whether or not it's appropriate to file, uh, special circumstances. And I wonder if that's appropriate, um, especially given the regional differences, should the attorney general's office have more of a role, uh, in, in alleging special circumstances in these kinds of cases, given, uh, the, uh, statewide import of these kinds of charging decisions. Mm -hmm. I don't know that the attorney general would want that responsibility. Uh, but I wonder if that uh, should be something that we sh we should uh, consider. I, that's a very interesting point. And we made a similar observation with regards to death penalty charging. Um, and um, and I you know it's interesting, too. We could probably that could probably be some sort of majority vote in terms of, you know, requiring I'm not saying we necessarily want to go there, but requiring attorney general approval or requiring personal approval of the elected district attorney, you know, that might also change the circumstances. Um, I also wanted to respond to something that Senator Skinner said. Um, so my understanding, first of all, on the data questions uh, that both Senator Skinner and Professor Ochin raised, yes, I think that the gender stuff is very uh, accessible, that we can break that down. I do not believe that we have access to uh, data on either felony murder or accomplice murder that that we'd have to look into each individual of the 5,000 cases. So I think that that is very difficult to do, not impossible. I suppose you could take a random sample, but um, there is some more there is some more granularity that we can get indefinitely by counties. Also, um, Senator Skinner, are you still there? Because I did have a specific question to you, for you. Okay, I'll save it because it's uh, uh, can relate to any of our recommendations. And it was basically a reformulation of the of what I was uh, sort of ruminating on before about um, where do we take a stand in terms of incrementalism versus, you know, where we think, you know, the law should be, even if we think that it's unrealistic that the, oh, there you are, Senator Skinner. Um, I, so I took with note, and I didn't mean to be, um, I'm, uh, that the legislature did not adopt our, rec our recommendations in whole cloth. And that's, that's appropriate, I think. You know, there are recommendations and hopefully they inspire. I mean, they are what we think is the best policy, right? That we as a body is, um, and they hopefully inspire uh, legislation and certainly people can improve upon them. They're, they're, we're not flawless. Um, but I guess my question to you was, were you suggesting that our recommendations should be more aspirational because we know that the legislature will make, make do with what they want 
or that we should try to aim more towards what would be more likely for the, legis for the legislature to adopt more fully. I didn't know wh which way that you were arguing in that point. Um, um, you don't have to answer now. I don't mean yeah, to. I mean, look, the legislative process, no process, no human process is without its uh, flaws, biases, or, you know, the legislative one, everybody calls, there, there's a term sausage making. And why certain things are put in, I mean, clearly, if I take example, my bill SB 81, the ledge, the, sorry, Judicial Council, went in there, as our justices pointed out, that was a very legitimate entity for us to interact with, to work with, to make sure the bill worked, for the judicial process. So that was a very, um, you know, perhaps for me, slightly frustrating, but productive process and had some, uh, you know, made some improvements that would make it work for the courts better. There are other aspects of our process that uh, someone else might call have no rhyme or reason. And so I want to put it that way. And that it, um, and, and the end result may not, and once it's put into statute, it is not easy to change. <laughs> and if it is then vetoed, for example, because of flaws that get stuck in there, it, you can't reintroduce, reintroduce the same bill. So uh, let us leave it at that. All right. So, yeah. Okay. Um, well, we've, we, this is obvious. This is a big issue for lots of reasons. One of the reasons why we decided to tackle it this year is because we had so much public comment about LWAP last year. Um, and obviously we continue to struggle with it, both as the appropriate policy and the politics of it. I think that we at least agree that there's you know, big problems and it's a big issue with our criminal justice system in California. Um, so I hope that we can come up with some uh, recommendation. Uh, Assembly Member Lee. I just kind of kind of echo what Senator Skinner was saying, and I, you know, in my view is the commission was set up for a specific purpose to make recommendations to our governing bodies, and I think generally, you know, this com com commission should do what you feel is best, right? You should make the you should make the policy recommendations that you feel are guided by the evidence, and let people like Senator Skinner and I worry about all the sausage making that happens. So I don't think you should have to constrain yourselves to think what we're doing. You know, I, I think as proven by SB 81, it's going to be a tough haul one way or the other, no matter how we do things. But I think you should not feel like you are constrained by what we do. And uh, assembly member, that's we should. Yes, you're, 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 you're part of we. Yes, yes. <laughs> in, in, that, in that sense, right? We're, we, Senator Skinner and I will have to wear the both hats. Of both we wear both hats. That's why you're here. That's Honestly, right. That is, no, in all sincerity, like that we value that you are, you know, the, the value, you know, a huge value that you bring to this committee is is your ties and you know your, that your feet are in both buckets. So, all right, we spend a, a good amount of time. I think we have some thoughts on this. We'll need to ruminate it on some more, which we do have time later today. But let's move on to the second um, staff recommendation. Yes, the first one's always longest. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so number two is uh, three strikes. Um, you know, I think everyone is familiar with this, but I think it helps us set the stage just to have a, you know, the baseline. So a strike is something that the penal code says is a serious or violent felony. If you have a strike, any felony after that, your sentence is going to be doubled. And if you have two prior strikes and your current offense is a strike, meaning it's serious or violent, you get a mandatory minimum of 25 to life. And often we see these sentences, you know, can be 50 to life or 55 to life because you can also get other enhancements based on your prior conviction so very long sentences um and you know a strike can be something that you did as a minor as a juvenile there's no period of time where a strike no longer counts um you know and we see cases where strikes from the 90s early 90s are used in cases today against people so where, where decades have elapsed um and then there's no requirement that your current offense has to be serious or violent to get that doubled sentence. So oftentimes when you're reading in the literature about this, this stuff, you, you, you see reference to second strikers. And I often think that term is a little misleading because really it, that can be someone whose current offense is not a strike, 
but they still get the doubled sentence. And it also includes people whose current offense is a strike and get the doubled sentence. So I, one thing that, um, you know, when we talk about this on the staff side, we're very careful about what does that term second striker means? I think it suggests that, uh, there's a little more rationality to the law than there is perhaps in it. So the proposals here would be to mirrors the LWAP discussion perhaps a little bit. Uh, the first one would be just to abolish the street strikes law and rely on the existing sort of recidivist enhancement statutes that are in the penal code. I think the most notable one is the five year nickel prior that um, we've, we've talked about before. Or you could take uh, other sort of um, tweaks to the law tweak probably isn't a strong enough word but uh, other changes to the law such as establishing a washout period saying there's some period in time where a prior conviction can't be used as a strike against you full stop uh, don't allow conduct that occurred as a juvenile to be used as a strike and the final one would be to require to create a true second strike circumstance where you're not going to get a doubled sentence unless your current offense is also a serious or violent uh, uh, offense and the outcome here would obviously be to reduce some of these extreme sentences we see that we've talked about time and time again don't seem to have any real connection to improving public safety. So a few more uh, data graphics here, so this is CDCR's um, population of strikers, so this is anyone who's serving a sentence in prison that's been lengthened by a prior strike the racial breakdown is very similar to what we see throughout the prison population it's 80% non white people of color. Um, and if we go down and look at our age demographic again, what's the demographics of people who were 25 or younger who are serving an offense that's lengthened by a prior strike? And again, we see the racial uh, disparities increase significantly to almost 90% are people of color when you look at younger people who uh, are sentenced as strikers. So that just takes us back to the uh, decisions that we could make today about the recommendation, which, um, you know, we can start with abolition and then or go down to these alternatives of establishing washout periods, um, juvenile conduct, and require the offense to always be serious or violent before the law kicks in. I just wanted to add a few additional data points, which is um, <coughs> just to, to make sure everybody's clear, there are other recidivist sentencing enhancements on, on the books. There are a number of them. So even an elimination of three strikes would not mean would still mean that people who've committed multiple crimes get longer sentences as a result. Um, also, if you include second strikers, it's the largest single group of folks in the prison system. I believe almost 30, 27 to 30 percent of people in the current prison system are serving um, second or third strike sentences. Is that right, Rick and Tom? That sounds right. And I think also at least on the people admitted every year, the vast majority of the of people are nonviolent second strikers, as they call them. So it's this category of folks whose current offense is not violent, um, but they still get that doubled sentence. So and and then the last thing I wanted to say was that data point should improve moving forward, assuming the governor signs SB 81, because we did, you know, make some indirect reforms to the three strikes law by, uh, rec you know, by with our with SB 81, which encourages judges to dismiss enhancements, including strikes in certain circumstances, including whether the strike was committed as a juvenile result of mental illness, the third, the current offenses, um, when somebody was uh, age, and um, these are obviously not requirements, but um, in, in the case of uh, the uh, past uh, um, Professor Ocean's point for would past victimization women more often, but to past victimization or domestic violence and correct. Or if there's racial disparities in the in the sentencing scheme in general, all those are encouraging to um, now. Um, they're not requirements. They're not certainly not eliminating, um, but they are. I think an improvement. Um, and you know, time will tell, obviously, about how, how much of an improvement it uh, it was. So I just wanted to add this. Uh, do people have thoughts, questions, suggestions? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I do. Uh, okay. On this one, you know, I, I my thoughts are a little different. I always thought that three strikes was an overreach and excessively uh, harsh. I particularly don't like the baseball analogy of three strikes and you're out. <laughs> 
it's catchy, uh, but it uh, imposes, as we can see, some very harsh sentences. And even though over time, portions of it have been you know, uh, mitigated, I think in the long run, it's on its way out. And anything we can do really to, to abolish it in its entirety would, would be fine with me. So I, I'm in favor of the uh, of all the alternative uh, proposals, uh, but I really don't have any any real objection to abolish it in its entirety, principally because, as you pointed out, Mike, that there's sufficient enhancements <laughs> already in the books that can uh, can add time in appropriate circumstances, but. But to impose like an excessive second strike sentence, you know, where there's like a non a non serious or violent felony, and before, you know, that there wasn't any dis any real discretion on that. So, uh, I think it's been a mess, and I think that the data that we see, in terms of the number, there were thirty seven thousand, and then the racial disparity for me is sufficient. Uh, to take a position or recommendation that it be uh, abolished. It was kind of a knee jerk reaction in the first place. And as I said, it's been kind of eviscerated over time and even in the height of its uh, implementation, you know, when I was on the, court, on the trial court, you know, judges worked uh, uh, with, you know, different, uh, uh, what's the word, I want different charts, in other words, to include certain factors to exercise their discretion. And then in, in Justice Werdiger's opinion, was it Ramos or Ramirez, I forget the name of the case. I mean, that was met with great glee by judges that they could indeed exercise uh, discretion and in particularly, uh, you know, circumstances that were totally inequitable, so. I think it served, you know, it never really served its purpose. It, it put a lot of people in prison for, for long periods of time. Uh, so I, I would go with the, the, the stricter recommendation of abolishing and then the alternative, the, uh, you know, plan B, so to speak, as working towards its, its, its abolishment. Uh, so, so uh, you know, I, I uh, concur with the recommendation. Uh, I believe that uh, three strikes should be abolished. Uh, it is racist. Uh, it does not deter crime. Uh, it has driven up our prison populations. It is costly. Uh, and it violates the notion that you should serve punish uh, of, of retribution and proportionality in my view. Uh, so it doesn't match up with the principles of punishment. It's racist, it's costly. I don't think we should uh, uh, have this on the books in California. So I support the recommendation and any incremental steps that we can take toward uh, its um, disuse. Demise, yeah. Uh, you're muted, Mike. All right, Judge Espinoza. I, I, I'm curious about how we arrived at the five year number as part of the recommendation as opposed to some other number. That is um, what's in SB 81, I believe, and was based on the recommendation last year about 1385. But yes, obviously that's an arbitrary number. And if, um, you know, we want to discuss that. It's, okay. it's, uh, there's no um, rocket science behind it. Let me put it that way. Skinner. Well, my comment should not have, oh, no, I'm not muted. Okay. Uh, this shouldn't affect our recommendation. We need to do what we think is appropriate and the comments made so far about the inappropriateness of three strikes law in California are absolutely correct. However, for the same reasons like uh, Justice Moreno pointed out about this, you know, baseball analogy and all that, it unfortunately remains popular among the public. And uh, so 
Um, and because it was an initiative, it would require two thirds by the legislature or as pointed out a vote of the people. And um, the, the complete abolishment, and again, this is just, this is just commentary, not what we should do. We should do what we feel is right for the revision of the people, but it would not have, we would not get two thirds to abolish the three strikes law. I, and again, I don't want to sound so definitive, do I have the crystal ball? No, but uh, it's highly, highly unlikely. Um, I can, could imagine with, with a hell of a lot of work there, we could potentially get some combination of the, the three, um, meaning the or the other, uh, uh, but that's where again, it might be and it could be left to the administration maybe to decide whether they want to pursue a um, initiative or a, a ballot measure versus a, a legislative vote. But I think we should proceed with what we think is appropriate. And we might consider something like that our recommendation be the abolish and why, giving all of our the good data and the good information as uh, uh, Professor Ocean and others cited, um, but we could also perhaps adopt that at minimum do, you know, that absolutely our first and foremost recommendation is abolish, but at minimum we would, uh, if that is not accomplished, that we would recommend whatever the, uh, at minimum, those alternatives. I want to add a couple of points. Um, first is, we knew coming into this year that we were going to address several issues that would require either two thirds vote or vote of the, uh, of the people, in, you know, including the death penalty. So, um, and we have one more of those on our agenda for today. One option that we haven't discussed is, and I believe this is correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Senator Skinner or Assembly Member Lee, is that a majority vote of the legislature could put this issue on the ballot. That you don't need a two thirds to put the issue on the ballot. Correct, um, correct. But it's very, it is also very hard. The, um, it perhaps is not as hard to get a majority vote for that purpose, but what is hard is to get the, that item before the body because the, uh, the two houses, especially in an election year, are, don't like to bring such questions before their bodies because of the circumstance of the, even though it, you're, you, the member are free to vote how you choose, your vote, yes or no, has implications. So, anyway. No, I was just, um, correct, correct. I, 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 mm -hmm. I, I gather that. I was just saying that it might be something that we consider as a committee and that all of these recommendations that um, uh, we say require a two thirds vote or a vote of the legislature, a majority of the vote of the legislature could put them on the ballot. Whether or not that's wise, polit politically feasible or not, it's just an option that we haven't discussed. Mm -hmm. yet. Um, other questions, thoughts, suggestions before moving on to the next and, and third recommendation, which is our final one that would require a two thirds vote or legislative or uh, initial ballot measure. I wanted to just briefly respond to Judge Espinoza's question about the five-year washout periods. Um, we did some research uh, on other states and what their washout periods were. We looked at a sample size of 20 states and of those 2012 did have some kind of washout period for, um, for felonies. Um, we had, looks most, most of the states had either five year, 10 year or 15 year, uh, the most common being 10. Um, and I can give you some of those states if you wanted to know them. Um, for example, Florida, Illinois, Michigan, Delaware, DC all had 10 year cutoffs for counting most prior felony convictions and um, there are a few that had 15 year cutoffs, uh, including the federal system. Uh, and then a couple just had five years. So uh, that was sort of our, you know, when we're looking at washout periods, we're looking at other states. 
Thank you. The, the reason I raised it, um, not, not because I think it's a bad number, but mm -hmm. there will be examples raised for people who are critical of that number of um, a person who may have been received a sentence of four years, gotten out and, and reoffended within a two year period of being released, but five years uh, from being convicted. So I, I, I support the five years. I, I just, um, I'm not sure if that made sense to you, Sen Senator Skinner, um, what, what I was saying, but um, it just seems to me that that you could you could come in within the five year number, but have having only had maybe a year or two of freedom before you reoffended. So, um, but I I support the five year. No, so I just I'll just add that in some of the other recidivist statutes. Um, that have washout periods. There's provisions that say that um, time spent in prison doesn't count, okay. or that picking up a new felony offense will, you know, even if you don't go to prison, will um, not count toward. We'll, we'll make it restart. So there's a, there's other provisions that we could add to that. All right, are people ready to move on to the next recommendation? Okay, 